Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, February 3rd, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There always seems to be so much going on these days that relates to biblical prophecies and signs that point to the return of Christ. And I, I for one, am fascinated watching it happen. I seriously enjoy it. Um, out of Christian headlines, Trump reportedly preparing to issue executive order protecting religious freedom. A four-page draft of an executive order on religious freedom that President Trump reportedly plans to issue has been obtained by the nation and the investigative fund. The document states that Americans and their religious organizations will not be coerced by the federal government into participating in activities that violate their conscience. Nice. Does that mean some of these bakers that have been sued for not baking cakes for gay weddings can now maybe reverse the judge's order? Um, interesting to see. Protecting our religious freedoms. Uh, this order would reportedly provide exemptions for all religious companies and institutions based on religious exercise, which it defines as any act or refusal to act that is motivated by a sincerely held religious belief, whether or not the act is required or compelled by or central to a system of religious belief. This is so refreshing. We're just coming off having a Muslim president who stands by the Muslim people who refuse to serve alcohol or drive trucks that contain alcohol or work in places that serve alcohol and yet they're protected. Yet when Christians refuse to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding, they get sued and lose. And Obama didn't back them. It's nice to see a president will finally back the Christians also instead of his own Muslim brothers like Obama always did. Another story out of Christian headlines. Trump and Pence prayed with Gorsuch before his nomination. There's a picture of Donald Trump, Mike Pence, and all these people standing with heads bowed, joining hands, and praying. I'm trying to remember, did we ever see such a picture from Obama in the last eight years? They're actually praying to God Almighty, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, some other family members, as well as Maureen Scalia and, and Paul Scalia, the wife and son of the deceased Supreme Court judge, praying, praying for guidance, praying for protection, praying that they will be led by God to make the right decisions. You know, whether or not Trump is truly a God-fearing follower of Christ, I don't know the real answer to it, but I'm not one to judge. You know, someone's faith is between them and God. God knows who his children are. God knows those who truly believe. I, for one, am very thankful to see a president not afraid to pray to God and let it be seen. Um, because there's others out there just waiting to take his place who believe otherwise. Out of LibertyHeadlines.com, DNC, Democratic National Con Convention or Committee, uh, contender Ellison holds press event with Care Radical. The leading candidate to become the chairman of the Democratic Party shared his Capitol Hill press conference with a leading advocate for Islamic radicals, Nihan Awad, who's the director of the Jihad-linked Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE. Keith Ellison's decision to share the microphone with CARE director on Wednesday afternoon highlights the willingness of party activists to deepen their alliance with the number of radical Muslim voters living in the United States, despite the huge ideological conflicts between the party's liberal base and the Muslim group's toxic Islamic ideology and aggressive Arab politics. I saw where Nancy Pelosi was on a hot mic 
and was telling this speaker, hey, tell the crowd you're Muslim. And of course, he came out and said so. But the entire media heard her coaching him, saying, tell the crowd you're Muslim. Why are they lining themselves up with an ideology that does not mix with democracy? One that denies that Jesus is the Son of God. Why would they be doing that? Uh, maybe Trump is just a short reprieve, a, a, a short little postponing of God's wrath on America. Hmm. I guess we'll see. Anyway, so much, so much happening. You know, you've heard of Trump's ban on these seven Muslim countries, not allowing refugees from these seven Muslim countries to come into the country. Of course, the media seems to fail to recognize that there's more than 40 other Muslim countries that are allowed to freely come and go. But not many people are talking about the Muslim countries banning Israelis. No one is protesting this. No one is standing up and speaking about this. Why is that? Are people afraid the Muslims will kill them or behead them because they speak out against them? I've been speaking against Islam for nearly 20 years. Um, out of United with Israel, not much is publicized about how Muslim countries discriminate against Israelis. This ongoing global debate over President Donald Trump's travel ban executive order has drawn online attention to discrimination displayed by some Muslim-majority countries against Israeli passport holders. Sixteen nations around the world prohibit entry to Israeli citizens, period. If they're from Israel, oh, sorry, can't come in. You're not allowed. No Jews allowed. Six of the seven countries on Trump's travel ban are on this list of countries that deny anyone from Israel for coming in. Sixteen nations, Algeria, Bangladesh, Brunei, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Malaysia, Oman, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Syria, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen all deny Israelis in their country. Where's the protesters? Where are you? Left-leaning liberals, where are you? Protest that, why don't you? Amazing. The world coming against Israel. Out of United with Israel, report says United States threatens severe steps if Palestinians sue Israel at the international court. Basically, Donald Trump said, hey, you sue Israel, and we're going to remove all funding to the Palestinian Authority. And in fact, we might close the PLO offices in Washington, and end all economic aid, and we might even go ahead and say, yeah, the PLO is a terrorist organization. You want to sue Israel? Yeah, roll the dice. It's so nice to have a president with a backbone, someone who will do something to fight injustice. Out of the Times of Israel, Israel hits back at the U.S. Settlement expansion is not the problem. Blaming Palestinians for stalled negotiations, Deputy Foreign Minister says the government elected to act on Jewish people's right to build in all parts of our land. Huh. Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel said the Palestinian stance, not the Israeli policy, the Palestinian stance was responsible for the stalled talks and highlighted the White House stated position that expansion in these communities was not an obstacle to peace. The current Israeli government was elected to act on the Jewish people's right to build in all parts of our land, and we must respect the will of the people who elected us for this purpose, she said. The White House itself holds that the settlements are not an obstacle to peace, and they never have been. It must be concluded, therefore, that expansion of construction is not the problem. In the past 25 years, all paths toward any kind of solution have been blocked by the Palestinians. They won't even recognize Israel as a Jewish state. I mean, come on, there's 57 Muslim states and 22 Arab countries, but they won't recognize one little tiny strip of land called Israel, the Jewish state? Amazing.
Out of Reuters, German newspaper said, yes, Iran did test a nuclear-capable missile. They did. It's This Sumar is capable of carrying nuclear weapons, and they also test-fired medium-range ballistic missiles. Germany's intelligence agency has confirmed this. Germany. Not Israel, not America, but Germany confirmed. Testing nuclear-capable missiles. All this talk, oh, our nuclear intentions are for peaceful purposes only, for medical purposes. Yeah, why are you testing nuclear-capable missiles then? Hmm. Again, president with a backbone out of the Times of Israel, U.S. said set to sanction 25 Iran entities after missile test. Trump and the United States administration reportedly expected to impose sanctions on over two dozen Iranian entities following the Islamic Republic's ballistic missile test this week in a move that could come as soon as today. Yeah, why our Muslim president previously decided to give $150 billion to a rogue terrorist nation that constantly champs death to America and death to Israel and then given a green light to go ahead with nuclear technology and all the funding to do so. Treason? Treason? Sounds very much like the very definition of treason to me. Anyway, let's get into the word. In Jude. Hey Jude. 1 verse 3. I, there's only one chapter of Jude. But in verse 3 it says, Beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Earnestly contend for the faith. You know, as we share the good news of the gospel with people at work, at school, with those around us, and we take it to the ends of the earth, like Jesus commanded in Matthew 28 19, we need to be aware that there's people out there who twist the truth. They seek to distort the truth. They want to dilute the pure message of Jesus Christ. There's the second largest religion on the planet completely denies that Christ is the Son of God. They deny he died on the cross. They deny he rose again from the dead. This is anti-Christ in spirit according to the Bible. Anyone who denies that Christ is the Son of God is condemned already. Jesus said this himself in John 3.18. Condemned if you don't believe in the only begotten Son of God. You see, in Islam, they teach Allah has no son. He has no heir. It's blasphemous to say that God has a son in Islam. See, the devil doesn't like anyone else to have his glory. That's why. The devil's too proud, too arrogant. Keep in mind, he was an angel in heaven, Lucifer. He was kicked out for his pride, for his arrogance, for wanting to be worshipped more than God. Read Isaiah 14. You can read all about it. Jesus saw him fall from heaven like lightning. Any belief system or any kind of teaching that does not tell the truth of Jesus Christ is a false system that can't be trusted. It's an antichrist system. You know, a lot of people want to add works or rules to the gospel. You know, they, they distort it to fit their own ideas of what it takes to be saved. They'll say, oh yeah, what Jesus did, plus you have to do this, this, and this, or follow some pillars to get to heaven. Yeah, no, that would be works-based, and the Bible says you're not saved by works, but by faith. People try to Water down the gospel by removing or, or downplaying the need for confession or the need for repentance or the need for your sins to be forgiven. 
A lot of people don't like to hear about sins. They don't like to hear that you're a sinner in need of a savior. Every single one of us were born that way, though. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. See, when unbelievers hear so many different versions of the gospel, they usually don't know which one to believe. Well, this guy sounds pretty good, and he delivers it quite nicely, and he says that Christ didn't die on the cross. Yeah, I think I'll follow after this false teacher. That's what unbelievers feel. Or they just simply choose the one that sounds the best, the one who maybe is dressed the nicest, or the one who has the most followers, or the one who drives the prettiest car, or has the biggest house. Hmm. There's always going to be those who try to make the gospel less than what it is, or more than it is. See, Part of the challenge for those of us who follow Christ and seek to serve him is to make absolutely sure that we're clear when we present the truth of Jesus Christ. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. That means being truthful with people about their sin, about their need for a savior. There's even teachings out there in what some will claim to be Christian churches that say everything will be fine if you just try to do your best because God loves you no matter what and will accept your best effort. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel spoken of in Scripture. And it's not the gospel that somehow we can work our way into heaven or, or do something to earn our way. And you certainly can't buy your way into heaven. It's only when people come to realize their desperate need for Christ, that they will humbly submit themselves to the truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you so much, he died on a cross to save you. He willingly laid down his life. He willingly took the punishment that we deserve for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Wages of sin is death. We should all be killed on a cross ourselves for the sin in our lives. Yet Jesus said, no, 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 I got this. Don't worry, I'll pick up the tab. This one's on me, I I've got this. You want salvation? I'm your guy. And Christ willingly had all our sins placed on him on the cross. In fact, that's why God couldn't even look at Christ on the cross. That's why Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God couldn't even look upon the sin that was piled on Jesus on that cross. But now God can look at us and see the righteousness of Christ in us. It's only when people come to realize that God's grace covers their sins, that they can fully appreciate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us to stand firm for the faith, to stand firm on the truth. We don't stand for a deluded gospel. We don't stand for a watered down or distorted gospel. We stand on the truth. Contend for the faith. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. In 1 Peter 5, verse 5, um, it says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Resist. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. You know, pride. This is one of Satan's deadliest tactics. It's one he's quite familiar with. Pride. Ever since the Garden of Eden, Satan has been spewing this great lie. 
Like he said in Genesis 3, verse 5, you will be like God. Yeah, go ahead, eat. You'll be like God. You won't die. You'll live. We all have to learn to overcome pride, which, again, that was Satan. That was Lucifer's initial sin, the one that got him kicked out of heaven. And it's the one, it's the, it's the tactic he uses against us, pride, pride. I know there's different levels of pride. There's different kinds of pride. When I was in high school, we wore these shirts under our shoulder pads in football that said bulldog pride inside. You know, we're, yeah, we're bulldogs. We're proud. We go out. I don't know if that's a different kind of pride than pride in oneself. But the Bible speaks a lot against pride. Proverbs 6 verse 17 in this passage that speaks of the things God hates. Haughty eyes, proud lips. They're two of the seven things that God hates. They're an abomination to God. Proverbs 27, 2 tells us to let another praise you and not your own lips. Even Christ spoke about pride in, in Luke 18, verse 14, when he said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All throughout Scripture, we're reminded that God doesn't like a prideful spirit. Pride. Why does Scripture have so much to say about pride? I mean, you know, you, you hear people all the time, Oh, I'm proud to be American. I'm proud to be a Texan. I'm proud to be this. I'm proud to be that. The Bible speaks against pride. I, I think... When it comes right down to it, a prideful person is saying, hey, I don't need God. I can do this on my own. I can do it my way. I'm a self-made millionaire. I did it myself. God has a perfect plan for us. And when we try to go it alone or do it without God, it only leads us down a path of self-destruction. No one knows better than God. He's seen pride destroy the lives of countless of his creations throughout time. Countless. Pride. Not a good thing. In the Old Testament, you see several things. Um... In Daniel 4, about starting in verse 28, the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. Until he acknowledged the Most High God, he was proud. Hey, how about King Belshazzar, who saw the handwriting on the wall and he received judgment because of his pride? Daniel 5, verses 22 and thereabouts. In the New Testament, the Pharisees, they were filled with the self-righteousness. Oh, I thank thee, God, that I'm not like this guy. I tithe and I pray and I fast and I, 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 I do all this stuff. Pride! Pride! Pharisees, they were self-righteous. They denied the work of Christ even when he was standing right before them. They had God in flesh standing before them and they thought they were so pious. They were so righteous. The Apostle Paul warned the Corinthians to not take pride in one man over another. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Peter warns about pride. Pride is devastating, I think, because it's so deceiving. You know, a proud man is always looking down on things, down on people. And as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that's above you. Right? If you think you're above everyone, then who's above you? Hmm. A lot of people don't quite get that. Um, I know a lot of people, they're, they're, they're quick to point out pride in someone else's life, completely oblivious to the stranglehold that pride might have in their own lives. Pride causes us to focus on being better than someone else. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not as bad as this guy over here, or, you know, that girl over there isn't 
as righteous as me or whatever. Being better than someone else. You know, here's the problem. We're comparing ourselves to other fallen sinners. Instead, we need to compare ourselves to Christ and watch how quickly the pride falls away when you realize how horribly far we fall short. Sure, it's easy to compare yourself to other people. But how about compare yourselves to the perfect, sinless Son of God, and let's see how you stack up then. Then it's a little easier to humble yourselves and realize, Lord, I need you. Forgive me for having this attitude of pride. Forgive me for thinking I'm better than anyone. Remember where you came from. And remember what God has saved you from. And I think God allows adversity into our lives because nothing gets our attention better than going through a hardship, a time of trouble, a time of sorrow. He allows these things in our lives in order to filter out pride, to remove the impurities, causing us to return our focus on him and him only and removing it from us. Like John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. Less of me, more of you, Lord. Hmm. And even if the pride in you is causing you to disagree with what I'm saying right now, you can't live a fulfilling life without God. You might think you can. You know, when God is out, then pride is in. We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and steer clear of this prideful attitude. Yesterday I spoke about laziness, slothfulness. Had some interesting comments come my way and some private messages, people asking me things. Hey, is this lazy? Am I being lazy if I do this or don't do that? And I love that I can cause some, some conversation amongst the body of Christ and, and cause people to do maybe a little self-examination. But laziness is never a good thing. In 2 Thess uh, Second Thessalonians uh, 3, starting in verse 6, it says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. It's a good rule. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If you don't work, you don't eat. You know, I think people don't realize that being lazy is actually a sin. It's a sin. Um, it, could, it could hurt your life. It could destroy your life. You know, to always be lazy and idle and fruitless goes against biblical teaching. goes against it. You're to put your hand to something. Um, anything that goes against God's word is a sin. You know, when Jesus was... Uh, telling the parable of the talents in, in Matthew 25, uh, about verse 26. The, the servant who buried his master's money, Jesus said, you wicked, lazy servant. Wicked, lazy servant. The Lord put wickedness and laziness or slothfulness into the same category as being undesirable, as being sinful. You know, the book of Proverbs gives us a, district, a, 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 a description of lazy people. Uh, they're a procrastinator, someone who puts off what needs to be done, Proverbs 20, verse 4. Uh, they'll use any excuse to avoid working, 
Proverbs 22, verse 13. They waste time. Proverbs 6, verse 9 through 11. A slothful person is neglectful. They're careless with whatever's going on around them. Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 32. You know, laziness isn't something meant for true believers, for true followers of Christ. You know, God the Father expects us to live with a purpose and to work and to contend for the faith, you know, to be lazy and not work would damage our testimony. We would be a bad example. Proverbs 25, 19 warns us, like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. A lazy person, a, a, an untrustworthy person leaves work undone and is a poor witness for Christ. I mean, what will unbelievers see in, in a lazy life that they would desire for themselves? Oh, well, this guy is depending on his parents to do everything for him. He doesn't work at all. He just sits on the couch and plays video games and eats their food and does nothing to contribute. Hmm. Hmm. We have a great opportunity to participate in God's work, in God's kingdom. And that includes not only working well on your job or your vocation as a demonstration of obedience, but we need to choose to work for Christ every day, sharing the good news of the gospel, not afraid to get your hands dirty. You know, John the Baptist, what an amazing story he has. In Matthew 3, verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. In the wilderness of Judea. You know, the scriptures tell us about the ministry of John the Baptist. He spent some 30 years in the deserts of Judea preparing for this ministry. 30 years preparing. And then it only lasted about six months before he baptized Jesus. And then People started following after Jesus Christ, Lord, King, Messiah. But in those short six months, he turned an entire nation to God Almighty. Now, he didn't, he didn't take the normal approach and go where all the people were. He was out in the wilderness and the people came to him. He didn't have the benefit of social media and the internet and cell phones and television and advertising. Hey, come out to the wilderness to hear the word of God, to hear about the Messiah. Come one, come all. Everybody come down. Come on down. He didn't have that. He wasn't some flashy preacher in a $10,000 suit with a $50,000 gold Rolex on his, what, on his wrist. He didn't have a $100,000 sports car and live in a $10 million mansion. He wasn't flashy. He wasn't one of these slick salesman kind of evangelists wearing the latest styles of his day. He had no advertising other than word of mouth of those who heard him speak, other than the testimonies of those he came in contact with. He wasn't like a lot of the mega millionaire preachers today you see on TV saying, oh, just tithe your money and God will bless you. Oh, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to drive a Mercedes. God wants you to be blessed. You know, even Satan knows the word, and he twists it just enough to where it doesn't mean what it was intended to mean. John the Baptist didn't do anything the way the religious leaders of his day taught or that it was supposed to be done in their seminaries, yet it worked. It worked. An entire nation was anticipating the Messiah through this man who wasn't normal. He had a wild hair and a camel skin and ate locusts and wild honey and didn't look like your typical preacher or pastor or rabbi or anybody of that day. I think one of the things that keeps people from being used by God is this this sheep mentality, this herd mentality. We're so afraid of what someone might think. And I get that. When I first started doing this, I thought, 
oh, I, I may not want this person to hear that because they know what I used to be. They, they know what I did back then. Oh, maybe I don't want this person to hear me speaking like this. But you know what? It came to a point where, you know what? It's not about me. It's about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care the people that knew me when I was a, a little troublemaker in junior high. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because it's not about what I've done. It's all about what Christ has done. People are so wanting to be like everyone else, and then they wonder why they're getting the same results as everyone else. That's not the way to do it. Here was John the Baptist completely yielded to God, completely yielded to the Holy Spirit, and he succeeded against all odds. So we need to put aside that pride and follow after God. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to give you wisdom and guidance and discernment and grace. Even against the crowd. And watch what kind of results you get when suddenly you're not worried about what people think, but you only want to submit yourselves to God and be used of God, be led by God. Have you ever said this prayer, Dear God, please use me for your glory. You ever said that? Maybe it's time you did. Submit yourself to God. Ask him to use you. Ask him to guide you. Ask him to give you the wisdom and discernment and the words to speak, to reach out to the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And watch what happens. I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Be safe if you're participating in some Super Bowl festivities. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday. God bless you guys.